If you've just built a brand new shiny website in Embraco V10 or maybe 9, and then you've gone and tried to run one of your web pages, however, it's taking an age to load, then this, my friend, is the video for you. Now, when it comes to performance tweaking a website, life just isn't simple as clicking a button and your pages magically load quickly. Performance tweaking in an application takes a bit of trial and error, and in order to make sure that your pages load optimally, you need to target multiple different levels of cache within your application. So that is why within this video, we're going to be looking at client-side caching, we're going to be looking at server-side caching, we're going to be looking at asset-level caching, object-level caching, bundling and minification, and who you can forget, pesky little view caching. So by combining a mixture of all these techniques, you should be on the road to performance mastery. Now, if you haven't come across one of my videos before, have you been living under a rock, you numbnuts? What you wanna do right now, because I know most people forget, is smash the subscribe button, because that will make you an absolute legend. Now, after doing that, if you want to help me grow this channel, then I'd very much appreciate if you click on the like button, and as a reward, I'll show you a picture of a turnip. Now, enough of this nonsense, let's have a look at how we can performance tweak our application. I'm gonna cover a boatload of configuration within this video. So instead of you trying to copy everything from the YouTube, I've done two things to make your life easier. So all the config you're about to see is available within the related tutorial below. There's loads of gists where you can copy and paste things. The other option is to download my starter kit and see it all working end to end. So you can get access to my starter kit from my GitHubs, so it's John D. Jones. On the homepage, you can see that we've got this pinned and Braco B9 starter kit. Yes, it is V10, but I can't be bothered to rename it. While you're here, if you want to keep on updates and become a legend, you want to follow me. And obviously, don't forget to start that kit. Woo! The first caching technique that I'm going to cover will be the client side caching. So, client side caching is really important. First, to allow CDNs to cache your HTML pages. Second, also means that browsers will make less requests back to your server and your server will be able to handle more load. Now, I've got browser caching, server side caching enabled on this page. And as you can see, it's loading in under a second. Smoke it. Now, in order to enable browser side caching, what we need to do is add certain cache headers onto a request. So if I look in my network tab, you can see that if I inspect my HTML page, go into my headers, scroll down a bit, I've got this cache control public max age equals 604,800. Now my cache control is based in seconds. So even though this is a huge number, I think this equates to a day from memory. And underneath you can see that it's being cached by my CDN layer because we've got a hit. In order to enable client side caching in your Embraco sites, you basically need to add this header into each and every request you want to cache. Now, when it comes to performance caching within .NET Core, you'll be spending a majority of your time enabling middleware within your startup CS or program.cs. Because we're using Umbraco 10, you no longer need to have to use startup.cs. If you want to, you can write all of your configuration and boot up code directly within the program.cs using the minimal API configuration. Now, personally, I still prefer using startup CS. I also know there'll be a load of people who are using Umbraco V9 watching this video. So we're going to add everything in startup. Yes. However, do what makes you happy. Now, whenever we're going to enable any of these performance caching techniques, there's basically two parts. So within our configure services, we're going to enable some middleware. And then within our configure method, we're then going to actually define that middleware. You'll see what I mean. So within configure services here, if you scroll down, you can see this services dot add response caching. So this is basically enabling the middleware, which will allow client side caching to work. And then within the configure, you can see that we've got this use response caching down the bottom here. So it's basically these two lines enable client side caching. Aside from just enabling it, we also need to say how long we want the browser to cache our pages. And this is done at a controller level. So as you can see here, I've got this beautiful blog controller. And at the top, we have this response cache attribute. So response cache attribute can be defined with a duration. 
get rid of that there we go duration and we can say put 90 in for a minute and a half now obviously when you're production environment you're going to be applying this attribute on multiple different types of controllers and having to duplicate this this duration in each and every one is a bit of a code smell so that's the reason why it's much better when you're enabling this type of caching to use a profile so if you want to use a profile you use the cache profile name property as you can see here my profile is called weekly and then if i go back to my startup.cs within my configure method you can see that I've got this add MVC method. Potentially, you can also use add controller. So if I did that, you can see that there's an add controller method. I recommend you use the MVC one. However, if you look at code online, you'll see both techniques being used. And then within this add MVC, you can do add options, cache profile, add weekly, add your new cache profile and set the duration. And then after that, you can just simply refer to this cache profile alias everywhere within your code. After doing all that, you're then going to hopefully see the output cache or the cache header, should I say, within your output. Now, I've got the exact same code running on my starter cut. However, as you can see, the professional headers are not shown. So you may have to test this in production rather than localhost to make sure that the headers are set. However, as soon as you see those headers being set, browser should start caching everything and you're one step closer to having that lightning fast website the next type of caching technique that we need to cover is server-side caching now if you've come from an asp.net framework background you'll be very used to the output cache so what would happen is once enabled the output cache would cache the response of a page request and then the next time that request came in the version from memory would be returned rather than the framework having to recreate that page. Now within .NET Core, we no longer have access to the output cache. One of the reasons for this is .NET Core can run on a Windows or a Mac or a Linux. So the way that the framework adds stuff into memory is a lot more complicated than it used to be. However, if like me, you're old school and you still want to use the output cache, you can. Now, luckily for us, there's a number of third party extensions which you can install, which will give you output caching capabilities. Now, the one that I've been using is the one by Mads Christensen because I think he works at Microsoft and he's done so much of the .NET plugins, VS Code themes, that kind of stuff. You know, I trust his work. So what you want to do is basically look at the web essentials.aspnet core output cache. So after installing this NuGet package, you're going to have the ability to enable an output cache. So, as I was saying, after you install this, in order to get output caching, you have to do those two things, enable a middleware and then configure that middleware before you can do anything. So again, going back to our startup CS, you can see that if I scroll down the bottom, we have got this services.output caching. So if you click on that, you can see it's using the Web Essentials one. Then within here, just like the add MVC option above, we can define a profile. So whenever using client side caching or output caching, always use a profile. So in this example, my profile is called default. And again, it's set to be a week. Now, after we've got our output caching enabled up here, we then need to use the use output caching call. And that's going to be within the configure method. And then after we've done that, we're free to start adding some output cache. So if I go back to our blog controller, you'll see that under my response cache, I've also got this additional output cache attribute. So response caching is for the client side cache. Output cache does what it says on the tin, output caching. And as you can see here, we've got our profile and we're just passing in that profile name, which has been defined here. There is one caveat when it comes to response and output caching, and that is page versioning. Now, if your website is using anything like personalization or you have anonymous and authenticated content, simply caching the first time a user visits your page might be a mistake. Let's for example, someone's logged in, they viewed their credit card page, you cache it, the next person comes along and views that page, they see user one's credit card details. So if you have different page versioning, you wanna make sure that pages are not cached. And the way that you can do that is via very buy. 
So if you look on the code below, you can see that both response cache and output cache provide some additional parameters. So the response cache has it vary by request header and vary by query string. The output cache also has vary by request header and vary by custom. And the point is that if you do have different versions, I suggest that you go and do some research because you'll probably likely need to enable these keys on your project. In the third caching technique, we're going to be focusing on images and files. So in the previous two techniques, we've been looking at how to cache the page HTML. However, if you looked at any of your images or files on your website, you will notice that the cache control has not been set. So what we want to do is enable the same cache control, however, this time on images and files. Now, the good news when it comes to asset level caching is that by default, the middleware is enabled. So this means that we don't need to go to configure services to do anything. We can just jump straight to the configure method. And within configure, we can enable something which is called use static files. So within our use static files, we pass in a brand new object, the static file options. And then within this object, you can see that we have a few properties that so we can do HTTPS compression. Let's do that with HTTPS compression mode compress. We like compressing things. We also have on pair on prepare request. From here, we're going to add in the control header that we want to target. That's the cache control. We want to make sure it's public. And we want to make sure our max age is set with some sort of time span. So as you can see here, I've got one minute. But realistically, you'll probably want to do something like days or hours, whatever makes you happy. Now, the good thing for static caching is that all you need is this line. You're then going to start getting all of that amazing cache sample stuff within your website. Often when you bump into a performance bottleneck on a page, it's because a certain operation on that page execution is just taking forever to load. So maybe some examples is an API request and it has to go over a network. Another example might be a database call. You have to read something from a database and it just takes forever and it kills your page speed. So in those instances, the easiest fix is just basically to cache the response of those operations in memory cache. And this is very easy out of the box with .NET Core. So on the screen in front of us, you can see I've got this very beautiful example. And in this example, I'm basically caching the date. And what will happen is that every 30 seconds, a new value will be added into the cache and the old one will be expired. And I'm doing this all through the iMemory cache interface. So this is out the box .NET. You don't need to do anything to enable it. What we need to do with our iMemory cache is simply inject it into our controller. Everything will be wired up for you. Now .NET Core also does ship with another interface called iDistributed Cache. And the difference between the two is basically how the cache is accessed. So if you're running a website and it's on a node of servers and you want to have a shared cache between them all, use iDistributed Cache. If you're just running on a single node and you want to add all the contents within that node's the single server memory, use memory cache. Now, in order to get going with memory cache, it's pretty simple. All you basically need to do is define some sort of cache key, and that cache key can be whatever you want. Now, in order to try and get something out of the cache, you can use the try get value. So pass in your cache key and then the value will be returned. And in this example, I'm using string. You're free to type this. So you put date, whatever, and it's all going to work perfectly for you. Now, whenever you're trying to write performance code, the best way to do it is try and get the value from the cache first. As you'll notice here, if you don't have a value in the cache, what we want to do is then calculate that value. And then as you can see here, using set, add that value into memory cache. So for example, which updates the time every 30 seconds, you can see I'm just getting the date time and adding it into this value called cache entry. I'm then just using the iMemory cache set method, passing in our cache key and passing in our value. Now, when it comes to using set, you can also pass in this additional cache entry options object. And I definitely recommend that you do this. So because server cache is limited and when it runs out, your whole website will fall over. What I recommend is whenever you're using this cache, you also want to put in expiry times. Now, using the memory cache entry options, you can define how that cache item will expire. So you have the options of using a sliding expiration date. 
This basically means my cached item hasn't been used for a week. Remove it from the cache. You also have the ability to do an absolute exploration. And this is saying, I want this item to be removed from the cache at the 15th of June. And it's also possible to change them. So whatever one comes first, we'll remove it. Now it is also possible to do dot remove and pass in the alias. We can pass in our cache key like that. However, my recommendation would always be to use the memory cache options over the remove method, but do whatever makes you happy. We're now going to move from the C sharp level into our HTML layer and have a look at how we can improve the performance within our views. Now, one of the really nice things for me about .NET Core was the introduction of view components. But the reason why view components were cool is because they could be async. So back in .NET Framework, we used to be able to use a partial view. However, it was a render blocking call and the partial view had to render before the page would carry on. This is not the case with view components. We can break things like our header and footer into view component as they're async. It's going to greatly speed up the time of our page load. Now, when it comes to view components, it's also possible to cache them using the cache tag helper. So let's have a look at how to do that because it is dead simple. So at the top here, you can see that I've added my header into a view component. And I'm rendering it using the await component dot invoke async. Now it is also possible to cache that response. So caching that response is basically going to improve the speed load of every single one of my pages. And in order to use the cache tag helper, we basically define a cache element on the page. So the cache element also needs a closing element. We're going to use the expires dash after property. And then in there, we're simply going to inject a time span. So I'm just going to cache my first five minutes. And then within the two elements, we simply just need to put our HTML or our call to our view component. Job is a good in. Now we can actually cache stuff on our pages while using async as well. This is greatly going to speed up your page response times. The final type of caching we're going to cover is bundling and minification. So in order to render any of our web pages and make sure they look pretty and they're snappy and responsive, we're going to be linked to CSS and JavaScript files. Within your solution, if you're not bundling them up and also adding them into a single request, your page is probably going to take longer to render than they need to. In Umbraco v8 and below, something called the Client Dependency Framework was shipped out of the box, which allow you to do the bundling and minification server side. Now, obviously, if you have a front end developer and they want to use something like a Webpack or a Vite, or however they want to do their front end bundling and minification, jobs are good and you can do it there. However, if you're just using vanilla JavaScript and vanilla CSS and you want to bundle things up, in the new world, we can use a plugin called Smidge. So, Smidge, as you can probably tell by this GitHub page, written by the same person who did the client dependency framework, Smidge is basically an ASP.NET core bundling and minification tool. The smidge is not necessarily Umbraco specific. However, it does come out of the box. So Umbraco uses smidge in the back end to its minification and bundling on all the CSS and JavaScript required to run the Umbraco back end. So this is the reason if you went to the smidge homepage, you can see that we have a number of steps. You won't need to do all of those steps with an Umbraco build because some of them will be taken care of for you. Now, in order to get going with smidge, what we need to do is go back to our classic startup.cs. As you can see right at the top here, we've got this call within a configure services to services, add smidge, get section smidge. So within our app settings.json at the bottom here, you can see that I've copied in configuration. So we've got the smidge configuration. We've got the data folder, which is called smidge. As you can see, it's rendered here in my output. So we've got some cache. We're going to have some JavaScript files and stuff within there. And then we've also got the version. Now, after we've defined this get section, we can then go on to the configure method. And then within configure, we can use the use a smidge helper. Now, using use smidge, we have the option of defining our JS and our CS bundles. For my sample site, this is pretty simple. I'm going to create a JS bundle with the alias JS script. I'm just going to put all the assets within my assets.js folder. So if I look at Wobby 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 Woot, 
you can see I've got assets, you can see JS. So I'm going to add in all of these breakpoints, browser, jQuery, main, util. And I'm also doing the same with my create CSS bundle in my assets, wobby, wobby, wobby root. You can see that we've got CSS, and we've got a load of CSS in there. So with smidge defined, we've got all of our files which are going to be added into our bundles. The next thing we want to do is render out those bundles. So if we go to my cache page again and have a look at the view, in order to render out my bundles, there's a few ways of doing it. Now, the recommended way is to do something like a script and then have the source and then use the alias for my bundle and then close it. And we can do exactly the same thing for the style sheets. Let's zoom in so you can see it a little bit better. So we can do link well style sheet href and then we've got our bundle here now it is also possible to access all of these files as an individual layer so maybe you've created multiple bundles and you want to do something specific with them so in this instance you can do a for each and you can use the smidge helper generate js url async pass in your bundle name and then you're going to get access to a load of file names and you can simply iterate them or do whatever you want and you can do exactly the same thing with our CSS. So generate CSS URLs async, passing in that CSS alias. And then if we go back and have a look at our cache page, you can see that I'm rendering out the bundles, which is sbjscriptjs.v1 and sbcss-script2. And then if I do a view page source, you can see that somewhere on my page, it may look a little bit funky. However, I've got a container and then on the container. This one, maybe I've got my link to the minified bundle. And if I open this one, you can see that everything's been minified and bundled together. If I look at the CSS bundle, you can see that everything has been chopped up and bundled as well. If you apply all of the caching techniques I've listed in this video, I can guarantee that you're going to notice a significant change in your page performance. Now, after applying all these changes, if your page load speed isn't what you want it to be, do not get disheartened. As I said at the beginning of this video, performance is a very trial and error process. I've gone through it enough times to be able to, you know, promise you that is a true state. Now, when it comes to performance, what I recommend you do is use a tool like Page Insights and Lighthouse, and then make some tweaks, test if the performance is better or worse, and rinse and repeat again. And if you use a combination of all the techniques listed in here, and potentially a few others, then eventually I promise you, you're gonna get there. Now in terms of metrics, I recommend that you aim to get all your pages to run under one single second. And I know one second will be a pain. However, if you look at all the UX books, the case studies, if your pages are under a second, everything's good. Anything after that, you're probably gonna lose some customers and some traffic. So that's your target. Now, if you have gone through this process yourself, and you notice a few performance techniques that I haven't mentioned, please do everyone on this video a solid and leave some comments below, and leave some thoughts. Performance tweaking is not fun, and especially if you're in the performance tweaking hell, any comments that you can give below will help other people watching this video and it will make you an absolute legend. If you made it this far into the video, then you, my friend, are an absolute legend. And this is the part where I need to pedal my words. So if you appreciate all the time and effort I put into this video, you can show me some love in a few ways. First off, my Umbraco V10 book is pretty much finished. It's like 99.8% there. So if you want the book, which is really concise, which will tell you everything from how to build a website, multi-language authentication, all the different APIs, performance tweaking, upgrading from V9 to V10, the book will give you everything you need. It's not very expensive. It's like 15, 20 bucks. The link is below. Go over there and show me some Aside from that, I know from first-hand experience that most of you forget to hit subscribe and like, which is why I have to repeat it all the time. So if you want to learn more about Umbraco and to become the best developer you can be, you know what to do. Otherwise, I really do wish you luck on your performance tweaking journey. Hope you're having a great day wherever you are. And until next time, happy coding.